So, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Bill and Ken who brought us here, as well as Paula, Annalisa, and John for making our stay so pleasant. Eritrea is magnificent. Uh, it's my first visit here, and I have to admit I'm very impressed. Uh, this is the team at the ESRF, the people that I've been working with for uh, eight years now. Andy, uh, John, and Yves Vatier, and all the rest of the people who have been working with us for a year each, coming from the University of Bath, very good students, undergraduates, that uh, I hope they learned and we learned from them and we produced all the results I'm going to talk about today. So this picture, I managed to capture uh, John and Andy the day before yesterday while uh, John was chairing Andy the other, the other way around. Uh, these people are uh, the most important collaborators of mine. So, My new group at the Department of Biology, University of Patras, is growing uh, quite rapidly, I have to admit. I have three postgraduate students, three girls, Natasha, Fotini, and Elena, and we are trying to continue all this work in the protein powder work word, uh, combining it with electron diffraction. That's my uh, challenge and my dream at the moment. So I couldn't find a better way of uh, starting this presentation. Max Perugge, many years ago, he said, why water boils at 100 degrees and methane at minus 161? Why blood is red and grass is green? Why diamond is hard and wax is soft? Why graphite writes on paper and silk is strong? Why glasses flow and iron gets hard when you hammer it? How muscles contract? How sunlight makes plants grow? And how living organisms evolve into ever more complex forms? The answers to all these problems have come from structural analysis. I think he summarized it all. So uh, Max Perut, a great, great crystallographer, got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1962 together with John Kendro for their studies of globular proteins, such as myoglobin that John referred to. And it was actually the first protein that Bob measured as a powder. And uh, hemoglobin. This is Max Perugge working with plastic models since computing uh, power and algorithms were rather limited back in the 50s and 60s. And on the right hand side, you see the structure of hemoglobin as he derived it from single crystal data. Uh, with extreme accuracy, it's an heterotetramer. Two chains have the same sequence two chains have a different one, and there are heme groups which contain iron, and iron captures oxygen, and that's how the breathing in living organisms, in uh, human beings, uh, is uh, happening. And extreme accuracy in the structure which impresses me, because back then it was not so easy to imagine a protein structure. And then Rosalind Franklin, who lived for a very short time, unfortunately. Uh, she worked in various systems, but uh, her main contribution was for the structure solution of the beta conformation of DNA from fiber diffraction data. And this shape is uh, the so-called cross of helix. If you analyze this data with uh, Bessel functions, which what uh, they did, uh, they derived the double helical structure of DNA. And uh, they started understanding how genetic information is uh, carried from one generation to another via the DNA double helical conformation. In 1962, apart from the Nobel that Perutz got, these three people, Crick, Watson, and Wilkins, got the Nobel Prize for the structure solution of DNA. And unfortunately, Franklin was dead, which I consider it as um, a little bit unfair. I think she should have been included despite her very early death. In any case, we all know that she has contributed an enormous amount. 
and Dorothy Hodgkin, who worked uh, in many, many different protein systems, insulin, which is a hormone, the first structure uh, was solved by Dorothy, and her contribution to protein crystallography has been talked about, has been discussed in every single meeting I've ever been to. Uh, an extreme uh, character and an extremely good scientist. So the, la the last result, which is a great, great, great uh, success, was the structure solution of the ribosome by Ada Jonath, Ramakrishnan, and Stides. And why is this so important? Ribosome is a molecular machine. Uh, the ribosome uh, complexes have molecular weights between 2.5 and 4 million Daltons, and they are consisted of many, many different proteins. And uh, together with the knowledge of the DNA structure, we can understand the central dogma of molecular biology. What it means is that we can understand how genetic information is copied from DNA to messenger RNA, how this information is read in the ribosome, translated, and finally proteins are produced from the ribosome. So the ribosome, the understanding of the function of this uh, complex uh, was a challenge for decades. And uh, the reason why I mention it is because uh, I think a new era begins now where a new generation of antibiotics, for example, will be produced based on the knowledge of the bacterial ribosomal structure. So people identify small molecules who will stop the production or block the way out of the proteins which are produced within the bacterial ribosome. I think this, uh, uh, this is uh, the greatest result in structural biology of the century. So as John mentioned already, we all started following Bob von Drill's first results. Uh, the first refinement was uh, performed for a powder data, synchrotron data of myoglobin, which, as I mentioned already, the first structure was solved by Perutz. And then Bob discovered a new structure of human insulin by grinding insulin crystals. He determined the structure. He solved it via a molecular replacement technique. And the structure was later verified by single crystals. The last result, the latest result from Bob was uh, when he displayed that we can determine the position and orientation of ligands in protein structures. Sh he showed uh, these examples, it's lysozyme uh, with oligosaccharides bound on the protein surface, as it's shown in this figure, and the synchrotron data were sufficient for locating uh, the ligand positions. This is very important result uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, where most of the experiments uh, concern the identity identification of new ligands for the development of new drugs. So today's presentation has this structure. I decided to talk a little bit about crystallization of proteins because there are many uh, questions about how we prepare our samples. Crystallography via powder diffraction was introduced very, very nicely by John. Uh, a successful example where we cryocooled insulin in order to extend uh, the sample lifetime in the synchrotron beam. Some methods that we use for analyzing the data and solving uh, structures. And some projects that we have uh, started and continue working on uh, during the last uh, four years. So, protein crystallization became a science, a scientific domain, because it's not easy. Uh, proteins dissolve and then precipitate if we are at the right conditions. So, the critical parameters is the pH, because protein molecules are charged due to the charge carried by the side chains of specific amino acids. The ionic strength, which is the type of salt that we use, or the type of another chemical that we use to make the protein precipitate. 
We use crystallization robots and screens nowadays, and crystallization can occur in nano droplets in order to minimize the amount of protein used. So if someone gets a single crystal like this, does a single crystal experiment, but if you have something like this. This is a powder, and this is uh, why the powder diffraction was introduced in the protein crystallography field originally. So if we are at the right conditions, crystallization conditions, so we use plates which are shown here, at the first stage we have precipitin, which is dark, and this is amorphous. Then, if we are lucky, the, precipitant, uh, the precipitate crystallizes, and this can be used in a powder diffraction experiment, and with time, a single crystal may grow. So, it's all physical chemistry, I think, protein crystallization, because it's based on phase diagrams, such as this one. On the one axis, we have protein concentration, the other axis is precipitant concentration, and we have various zones. This is the most important line, which corresponds to the solubility curve of a protein molecule, and it's different for each protein. That's why crystallization is difficult. We don't know this line. But what we can find out is this line where precipitation starts by mixing a salt and the protein solution using an optical microscope. At the point where the solution starts becoming milky, we reach uh, uh, this line. So as a physicist, in the beginning, I start from here, which to my mind is, this, uh, is the most easy part of the phase diagram. So we work in the supersaturated region in order to induce nucleation and then crystallization. Nucleation is basically aggregation of protein molecules with a certain periodicity which increases with time up to the point where a crystal is formed. So nuclei are formed here and then the crystal, if we are lucky, starts forming uh, at a later time. I found this video which shows uh, lysozyme crystal growth and I think it's very, uh, very nice. It shows the nucleation and then the crystal growth at certain positions and the creation of new nuclei as well. So we have crystal growth and nucleation at the same time. New crystals appear, the old ones grow, and this is what is happening, in fact, in the case where we are at the right position in the phase diagram. With these crystals, you can do uh, very nice single crystal diffraction experiments, but unfortunately, not everything uh, is like a, a lysozyme. These are crystals of human insulin that we prepared using uh, different ligands at different pH values. And from the morphology, we can have a first idea about the crystallographic symmetry. These needle-like shaped crystals usually are orthorhombic or monoclinic, whereas these are rhombohedral, for example. This is a phenomenology to know uh, what we have before we start uh, collecting X-ray data. So if we have a single crystal, we select the right diffractometer. This is a kappa geometry. We collect data upon rotation of the single crystal around different axes. We collect data which look like this, and I like this video very much because, as you will see, it shows how the reciprocal space uh, cuts evil spheres. So I use it a lot for teaching purposes. It's a very nice video. And if the data are complete and high resolution, resolution sufficient, we get uh, the structure. However, the resolution uh, is depend depends on the data and the crystal, and as the resolution goes down, we start losing information from the electron density, so we start losing the positions of the side chains, and here is the resolution. At six angstroms, we can see just the shape of the molecule, we cannot see all the details, whereas when this video started, 
at point six, we can really nicely see the aromatic rings of the side chains of three amino acids, which have aromatic rings, which are tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine. These are the first things which we look in a map because they are the easiest to identify. And then sing single crystal crystallographers use automated procedures in order to fit the model uh, within the density. Unfortunately, uh, maps produced from powder diffraction are not that clear to use automated procedures. You will get something wrong. So one has to work more manually. But with single crystals, everything has been automated to help to speed up the structure solution process. So, uh, to date, we have worked uh, on more than 15 different proteins, known and unknown as well. At the moment, we work just with real problems. In the first three years, we've been working with model proteins to test algorithms and instruments. And there are 41 structural models which have been deposited in the protein data bank. So John mentioned the cryocooling process, which uh, is not simple because you have to be fast and find the right cryoprotectant to avoid freezing of the water, which occupies 50% of the unit cell usually. This is a successful case where Yves Atier, by using captain tubes and various other tricks, managed to cryocool two polymorphs of insulin, which are called T6 and T3R3. Both correspond to hexagonal insulin. And uh, by cryocooling, we extended the sample's lifetime by, 100, uh, by a, a factor of 100. So data could be collected in this region. Four angstroms to the minus one correspond to 1.5 angstroms in this spacing. And although the peaks at high to theta are very low in intensity, overlapped, and so on, they are still very important for the quality of the electron density maps. Here is the data set and the red field refinement of the T6 form of insulin. And by using this data, we could really easily solve the hexameric uh, polymorph of insulin, which uh, looks like this. It has six uh, protein uh, chains around a zinc atom, and the zinc atom holds the polypeptide chains together. The electron density maps were very, very impressive coming out from this data. So they approach single crystal limits. They are not broken. They are not as biased. And I have to say, we don't work just with uh, different electron density maps, but we mainly use total omit maps, which are much less model biased. So the density was really high quality. It immediately showed where the zinc atom should be positioned. And when we compare the structure which was solved and refined from powders with a single crystal model, the agreement was pretty good. Here in yellow is the single crystal, uh, green is the powder model. So within the resolution limits that we have in powder diffraction, this case was a successful and of course it was a, a test case. Uh, this slide shows uh, a side chain before and after refining its position and how well it agrees at the final stage, uh, stages of analysis with uh, a total omit map. So cryocooling is worth, it's not easy, but it's worth trying for extending the sample lifetime in the beam. So we use both single crystal and powder software in order to solve the structures. Uh, John mentioned the program PROD developed by him, uh, which we use for intensity extraction via the poly method. And of course, we use GSAS still to refine the structures using stereochemical restraints and multiple patterns. That's very important. We don't refine a structure using only one powder profile because it's, uh, uh, it's more difficult and the information content in many cases is not enough. 
there is a crystallographic server uh, like uh, ours, CCP14. The single crystal community has the CCP4, which has a huge amount of software that can be used for structured solution analysis and viewing. And we use three main viewing uh, software, which are the Swiss PDB viewer, CUT, and PyMol for uh, fitting the model to the density. So there are two main methods for solving a structure uh, in protein crystallography and in crystallography in general. Uh, one is the molecular replacement technique. We need to know a starting model of a sequence homologous uh, protein. Uh, a case where the method was successful was uh, the first real problem that we had to work on. Uh, it's a domain. Uh, of the protein poncin, which exists in muscles. Uh, the domain has an homology of SH3, and the samples looked like this. They were needle-shaped uh, microcrystals. So we collected various profiles uh, at ID31. One of them is shown here. The data were indexed, and we could obtain a starting model of a 60% homologous protein from the protein data bank. We used this model to apply the molecular replacement method, and we could easily find the position and orientation of this model in the new unit cell. Now, this was uh, a quite good result, but then we had to rebuild 40% of the protein chain with the right amino acids, and this could not be uh, automated because the density maps are noisy and are biased. So we could use various different types of maps in order to determine the positions of the 40% of the amino acids which were not correct. And this procedure took uh, a few months to complete. Finally, by using multiple profiles corresponding to slightly different lattice parameters induced either by radiation damage or by slightly different crystallization conditions, we refined the structure and we got uh, a model which uh, looks like this. Here you see parts of the total omit map at the final stages of analysis. Uh, we had 554 protein atoms in the asymmetric unit, and 36 water molecules were also located from omit maps and difference electron density. So protein people look more the, the fit to the electron density rather than the data. And here you see at the final stages of analysis a few amino acids and how well they agree with different electron density maps. This is basically the end of the analysis. When we have a reasonable model, stereochemically reasonable, the fit to the various density maps is quite satisfactory and the fit to the data is quite satisfactory. In red, you see some of the water molecules which are bound on neighboring uh, amino acids, and basically they correspond to the first, uh, first hydration shell which surrounds uh, a protein molecule. This is the structure. It contains no helices. It's just a beta sheet. All these arrows have a certain uh, geometry, and they are called beta strands. And then the rest of it is uh, very flexible. That's why probably we couldn't get a very large uh, single crystal. Here you see the distribution of the charge uh, on the surface of the molecule. Red is negative, blue is positive, and this kind of uh, uh, representation is helping us to see where uh, an active site could be located, where a ligand could bind. So that was uh, a successful case and the first unknown problem that we worked on. If we have no starting model, no information about the structure, the method that we can use is called isomorphous replacement, and we need usually to co-crystallize the protein with a heavy atom, a strong scatterer. We measure both the native and the derivative, or the derivatives, if we have multiple, and based on the differences in the data, we try to locate the positions of the heavy atoms, 
solve the phase problem and later on solve the structure of the protein. Uh, the first time we tried to test uh, whether this method uh, would work well with powder data uh, is lysozyme, tetragonal form, with these lattice parameters and this space group, and it was co-crystallized with gadolinium and holmium, two lanthanides that really have a very strong scattering power. So we had three samples in total, and from the differences in diffraction uh, between the three, uh, we could uh, apply the isomorphous replacement method and find not only the shape of the molecule, but also the secondary structure uh, of the molecule, which means basically the four helical regions of the molecule. This was the first time we saw secondary structure de novo, uh, considering that there was no starting uh, information about the structure. It was in collaboration with uh, the group of Mark Shields in uh, Lausanne. So, uh, a project which started uh, a couple of years ago, and it's one of my main future directions, uh, corresponds to structural virology. Uh, we collaborate with a group, uh, an institute called Architecture et Fonction de Macromolecule Biologique. It's situated in Marseille, and they work with RNA viruses. So a virus has a heart, which can contain either DNA or RNA, and a capsid, which is consisted of various proteins. The first sample uh, we uh, received corresponds to a macro domain, a domain of 120 amino acids of non-structural protein 3, which is located on the capsid of Majarovirus. Majarovirus has been seen uh, for the first time in Cuba in the 1950s, and it's uh, one of the possible viruses which could cause epidemias in the future. And that's why uh, its structure solution uh, is quite important. However, whatever we tried during crystallization, we always get these needles, and we can have longer or shorter needles, but they are not sufficient for a single crystal diffraction experiment, and that's why these people uh, contacted us. Uh, crystallization still occurs. I hope my students, as we speak uh, in Greece, they are not uh, in the sea, but uh, they try to improve the crystals and improve the data. So the first da good data set that we got uh, was at ID31, but the a better one was obtained at ID11 at a hard energy, and here is the image and the integrated profile showing reflections up to 6.6 .6 angstroms resolution. From this data, of course, we could not solve the structure, but uh, we got that it's trigonal uh, with this lattice parameter, 61 and 94, two molecules in the asymmetric unit and 58% solvent based on the Matthews coefficient. So that was uh, not very satisfactory because we couldn't solve the structure. And then there is a new methodology in protein crystallography. In order to avoid cryocooling, uh, people try to use humidifiers in order to avoid uh, dehydration of the sample and collect data at room temperature. So Yves Vatier isolated one urchin one bunch of needles, put it in this nice holder, and in front of an area detector at ID14 at the ESRF, which is a protein crystallography beamline, and he collected data at room temperature, which extend up to four angstroms resolution. And despite the fact that the form factor decays and the data decay, and here the information content is much less, Again, based on this data, we got a first preliminary model from molecular replacement, and here you see uh, the two molecules in the asymmetric unit and how each molecule looks like. This domain is important because it has this active site and it can accept ligands such as ADP, and that's why uh, we think it can be used uh, for producing uh, new drugs against Majarovirus. Uh, then, uh, for several years now, uh, we work with uh, pharmaceutical companies in order to screen a large number of uh, protein powders. 
Uh, one collaboration is with uh, Zanofi Aventis in Mont Montpellier and uh, a CNRS lab in Marseille. Uh, so the protein is called ureate oxidase and a very common form of ureate oxidase is a homo tetramer with molecular weight 135 kilodaltons which uh, forms very uh, beautiful microcrystals and when we measured uh, the orthorhombic polymorph of this uh, homo tetramer. We got data which look like this. It's a forest of uh, reflections. This is a polyphit. Uh, this data were collected at room temperature. Very rich content of information. Very well crystalline material. And here you see uh, the three lattice parameters. Based on a few of these data sets, we tried the molecular replacement method and we wanted to see the quality of the electron density maps. So we cut out all the side chains and uh, this is called a polyalanine model because alanines do not have a side chain. So alanines are displayed here in light blue. The correct amino acids are shown in light gray and the density map around each of these amino acids is also shown. What this slide shows is that the electron density produced from molecular replacement and powder data was good enough for identifying uh, in principle the aromatic rings, which is the easy thing, and later on, all the rest, each one by one, uh, the amino acid sequence. So these data were very good and we could uh, solve and refine the structure with no problem. We screened a large number of samples wh uh, which were prepared uh, using different ligands and different pH uh, or precipitant salt type and so on. And here you see six different samples which correspond to six different phases, different symmetries. And here are the candidate models which are available in the protein data bank. John already showed a nice table. The problem is that although the first, the orthorhombic phase, gave data up to three angstroms, the rest, since they are much larger in unit cell dimensions gave data from 6 to 12 angstroms. So based on this data, we could only index them and not solve the structure. So at this point, we stopped and we tried to improve um, uh, data and crystal quality. Marion Giffard in Marseille, in our collaborating group, crystallized the protein in pure water, which is uh, quite unusual. And when we collected data, we identified a new polymorph previously unknown and probably because uh, of the lack of good quality single crystals uh, under these crystallization conditions. These are the data. It's an orthorhombic structure and now we have collected uh, a few better data sets in order to uh, solve the structure using the molecular uh, replacement method. Another collaboration is with Novo Nordisk in Copenhagen. It's a huge project which started uh, four years ago, I think, uh, on human insulin. Uh, our uh, role is uh, focused in two axes. One is the production of microcrystalline drugs, and that's why powder diffraction is quite essential for them to uh, characterize the different polymorphs. And the other is to screen, again, a large number of samples without spending time for a single crystal preparation. I have to admit that when I first heard that insulin in the human body is in uh, nanocrystalline form, I was very surprised. There, most of the proteins are amorphous in nature, but insulin and some uh, pr uh, insect virus proteins are uh, crystalline in nature. So that, uh, that are, uh, these are a few exceptions. 
So again, we try to construct a phase diagram by varying the physical chemical environment of the protein. And when we use a specific ligand and we vary the pH, look what is happening here. From 5.7 to 7.7, .7, we got six different polymorphs corresponding to orthorhombic or monoclinic phases, plus two new polymorphs, which were then solved from microcrystal diffraction at the Swiss light source. Uh, the surprise was uh, big uh, for Novo Nordisk because this protein is one of the most well studied. Its function is known for 80 years, but still there are polymorphs which have not been characterized. And this is what I like in biology. You never run out of uh, interesting problems to solve. These are samples that uh, my three uh, Greek students prepared using different ligands, benzyl, resorcinol, phenol, cresol, and so on. And these are the samples uh, we got uh, to Grenoble with 150 samples, four people working day and night. It's a huge production when one has students. So uh, I can already uh, say that we have found another new polymorph, crystallized at very low pH, uh, but uh, I'm not ready to present it. Hopefully in Madrid uh, we, we will have uh, more results uh, to show. And finally, uh, I'm trying to set up uh, a lab in Greece, apart from our crystallization lab, which is ready and operational, a diffraction lab where we can screen these 150, 200 samples and go to Grenoble with the best ones. So one uh, configuration uh, that was very uh, successful uh, for a lab diffractometer is shown here. Uh, it has an X-ray tube and it has extra sets of divergence and solar slits before and after the sample. We measure in transmission usually and there is an extra receiving slit here before the detector plus focusing mirrors and analyzer crystals. Without this configuration, we haven't managed to get good data. With this setup, we got surprisingly good data for lysosomes. This measurement was done at Panalytical uh, in Almelo, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if we use the latest, the D8 from Brooker, probably we'll get an extremely good pattern as well. This, comes, uh, this corresponds to the tetragonal phase of uh, lysozyme. Uh, quite good data, good enough for indexing, 20-hour scan. Uh, the sample resist because uh, the dose rate in the lab is much, much uh, less than in the synchrotron. And this is a pattern for the hexagonal uh, insulin. Again, good enough for indexing and a little bit further in our analysis, uh, which uh, are good enough for doing a first screen of the various samples. So I would like to thank all these people, first of all, Andy and John, uh, with whom I've been working all these years and I continue working, Yves Vatier and all of our students, as well as uh, my, my new students plus collaborators in Greece, all these people for providing samples and ideas, and of course, Bob Von Drill for providing not just ideas, but software, advice, he guided us all through, and now we, have, we are a little bit further than where we used to be 10 years ago. UNESCO and L'Oreal for a fellowship that I got in 2010, and also University of Patras for a three-year grant, which pays for these uh, people working with me in Patras. Uh, I would also like to thank wholeheartedly Radovan Czerny, Heng Sheng, and Wim Brass, who have donated equipment uh, for our diffraction lab in Greece. Our budget is very limited, so uh, I'm very grateful to these three people for their donation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Reina, for that for that magnificent uh, talk. Um, are there are there any any questions? Yes, down there. Hi. You say that no, you use name uh, first. Don't name. Giulio Amponti from University of Bologna. 
you say that you, 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 use, you use more than one pattern to, and you refine with more than one pattern to get more accurate results. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain again how it works? Because mm. I, I think I didn't get it. It has been mentioned, this is not our idea, it has been mentioned already by Bill and Lynn and Ken. If you have overlapped reflections, you try to deconvolute them. One way to do it is by varying a parameter which will affect your lattice, and if this effect is anisotropic, one lattice parameter increases, the other decreases, the peaks move to, towards different directions, and that's why we use multiple patterns. In one profile, the peaks may be overlapped, in another may be separated. Yeah, yes, but, but this, is, this happens because you change something in yeah. the structure. Yes. So, and you do refine them all together? The lattice parameters, yes, but we pay attention so that the change is little, so you don't affect the structure as uh, the molecular structure at the resolution we see at least, right? Okay. So you affect only by a little amount the lattice parameters in order to deconvolute the overlapping peaks. Okay, okay. So. Any, any, more, any more questions? Yeah, Colin. Colin Pullum, University of Edinburgh. Um, this is a fantastic story you're telling. And could you comment on the potential for where this is going? I mean, I mean we, you can see how protein crystallography is becoming more and more important. Your, your methods, to me at least, seem to be potentially could be a step change in the way that uh, uh, protein crystals are, uh, protein crystallography develops. Mm -hmm. Originally, the method was uh, considered just for screening, which exactly as it was for any other area, right? Since we are crystallographers, we saw a few more things and we went much further than that. So I think the method will be used, and it's already used, for cases where the single crystal growth is uh, very, very hard. For example, membrane proteins, such as the Photosystem 3 that uh, John Spence uh, showed uh, working, or virus proteins can be hard to crystallize. So for cases where single crystals are unavailable, for microcrystal in drug formulation, which we do with Novo Nordisk, and for screening. These are the ways I see that the method can be used quite easily. Yep. Uh, Mark Sen, um, University of Edinburgh. Um, I know the uh, incoherent scattering must be very bad with neutron diffraction, but has there been any work done? Uh, with deuterated samples or maybe just deuterated solvents? Yeah. Uh, okay. We tried <laughs> at the ILL in Grenoble in collaboration with... Uh, there is a big uh, deuteration lab uh, directed by Trevor Forsyth, Matthew Blakely, and so on, and a number of people. Our problem was the resolution of the data obtained from an instrument such as D2B or D20, because the low bank of detectors gives very low, uh, broad peaks, and uh, this is where we want to measure. So we haven't tried ISIS or another institute. At the ILL, the data due to the instruments were not satisfactory, so this is where we stopped. But uh, it's a very good idea because you can see the solvent uh, shells and the hydrogen bonding after deuteriation with neutrons. Plus, as uh, someone mentioned, maybe Laurent Chapon, there is no radiation damage. So that's the m even most uh, important reason. But unfortunately, it's very early days, so we didn't pursue that further. David Isaacs. <clears throat> Fantastic talk, actually, and uh, it's amazing that you can uh, you know, get that level of uh, complexity from powder diffraction data. I just never thought it was going to be possible. 
but uh, you talked about the insulin uh, in the body being nanocrystalline, and I was just wondering if there was something generically different from the, uh, the single crystals and the small single crystals that the protein crystallographers traditionally work with mm -hmm. uh, and what you're given to work with, because I mean, I guess you often are working with the ones that are hard uh, mm -hmm. to crystallize. Is there something you know, generically different between what they work with and what you work with? And uh, I guess the rider to that, is there something specifically different mm -hmm. between the nanocrystalline insulin that's in the body and what uh, you know, Dorothy Hodgkin and others uh, did all these years ago? Mm. Well, I, from results to date, on measurements on microcrystals, because now we can check the microcrystals which consist the powder on a microcrystal diffraction beamline, we do not see uh, such a big difference. We did not see any difference between a large single crystal or a small single crystal. I think the reasons why sometimes we cannot get a big single crystal might be because the protein molecule is very flexible, for example, such as the virus protein domain I showed or the SH3 domain. They don't have helical regions, they're flexible, and although the periodicity leads to a nano or microcrystal, cannot lead to a large enough single crystal. But that's my interpretation. I'm not a biologist, so I, I keep a little bit of, uh, I pay attention to these uh, areas. Mm -hmm. Radiation damage, because there were many questions about radiation damage, it's not as simple as it may sound, because we have uh, sulfur, sulfur bonds breaking, we have hydrogen bonds breaking with increasing exposure time, dehydration, 50% of water which exists in the unit cell comes out, plus free radicals which are generated due to the exposure to the beam. So it's a, c a complex phenomenon. That's why nobody can give a clear answer. We work at soft energies on ID31 just to improve the peak shapes and to spread out the patterns. Of course, the samples suffer more from radiation damage at s soft energies, but we get better, uh, more spread out patterns. It's only John at ID11 who has the uh, ability, the flexibility to uh, move away the detector. Uh, that's how he can work at hard energies. But at ID31, it was not possible. Saul Lapidus, Stony Brook University. Um, in the small molecule world, we still have problems convincing people of powder diffraction. What's the reception in the protein crystallography world? <laughs> Both enthusiastic after 10 years, because it's been now 10 years that we are trying to do that, Bob, much longer, both enthusiastic and skeptical. So <laughs> they start uh, thinking that they can get some structural information, even if not the complete structure some structural. For example, our lattice parameters are much more accurate because we get the whole profile in a shot. And that's something that they got to understand. And we had to say, but you tune your beam lines by using silicon powder in order to calibrate the wavelength. So one would expect that they would have got that, eh, no? So, <laughs> so, so they trust lattice parameters up to a certain point, space groups, and uh, maybe the molecular replacement they can accept, the structure refinement, they start being a little bit uh, afraid. <laughs> and, and do you see a role for anomalous? scattering as well. Ah, yes. So uh, probably John Halliwell will present some uh, results in collaboration in Madrid. Uh, it's the most uh, difficult uh, thing. Together with Andy and John, we have done various experiments trying to use the anomalous dispersion uh, and the MAD technique to solve structures. To my mind, is the most challenging. Uh, John Halliwell has obtained some interesting results, but in comparison to molecular replacement, is definitely much harder because the anomalous signal is hidden 
due to the fact that the Friedel pairs in powder data are exactly overlapped, so we cannot work exactly like the single crystal people do. Okay, so um, thank you, Rena. Thank you, John. I'd like to thank them both in this coffee time.